The idea of this panel is to discuss some of the exciting things happening in academia and thinking about you know, the innovation related to, to disability in academia and, and how we can translate that uh, to the, the, the users and to the community. And we have three uh, esteemed panelists with me. I'm very happy to moderating this discussion. Uh, James, who's been doing uh, very interesting work, especially with the, the final year students, one of his key courses, which, I, which we'll uh, uh, get to that as the panel goes. Rachel, who has uh, been working with the linguistics, having this really interesting uh, mix of prototyping experience and applying that in a humanity linguistic context. And then Mengi, having the, the, the luxury of playing in the both sides, uh, you know, innovating, as well as consuming. So that's, uh, uh, I'm very excited to hear his thoughts on that. And then uh, we'll have Victor's video. So the way we would run the panel would be, I'll get the panelists to share their initial thoughts uh, in six to eight minutes, and we'll go through the, the panel. And finally, while you are reflecting on what the panelists said, we will play uh, the sharing from Victor, and then we'll open up the questions for you. So that's how we hope to utilize this remaining 40 plus minutes. So let's start with, with James uh, and with opening remarks. James, over to you. Thanks, Ding. Yeah, so I'm James. I'm from the uh, Department of Biomedical Engineering in NUS. Now, if you think about the word biomedical engineering, you know, most people will think about medical implants, uh, artificial organs, tissue engineering, and things like that. Uh, in fact, my primary research area was uh, in nanomedicine, right? Uh, but that was until maybe 2019 and tw around 2020, actually, uh, when I started to realize that uh, there's this whole area about assistive technology, which actually doesn't fit in any traditional type of uh, engineering discipline. Right? So if you, and most people would think about assistive technology in terms of like uh, re very rehab based. So, you know, coming up with devices to help people do rehab and things like that. Um, but assistive technology is more than that, right? So it's, it also encompasses AAC, encompasses like uh, your cochlear implant, Baha implants and things like that. And unfortunately, um, when I surveyed the um, uh, institutions of higher learning courses, uh, there are unfortunately not a single course in Singapore that helps uh, engineers or develop engineers to be trained, to understand, and to be able to develop uh, these technology. And so this is where I came, I come in. Uh, and I started two courses um, right around 2020, yeah, in the midst of COVID, unfortunately. Uh, so I started a course in Geron Technology and Assistive Technology for PWD. For Geron Tech, is uh, for seniors, right? It, I run it from Jan to April. Uh, assistive Tech is uh, from August to November. In fact, I just finished my fourth run this uh, semester. So under this course, right, we get a series, we, we do lectures, right? And we get different people uh, to come and do guest lecturing. Uh, but very critical component of this course is where we get students to work in teams and uh, we partner with a community uh, organization or a disability service provider uh, to identify a specific client and the students then do co-design together with the client based on an identified need. And so if you look at the slide, right? So they will uh, do prototyping, uh, I mean ideation, go through the entire design thinking process and come up with a prototype at the end. So, um, and right after the whole course ends, right, typically we have between seven to 10 different prototypes. We will then select about two to three, which we think has got a high chance of community deployment and upscaling. Uh, so then we put them under our Be Good initiative, where then the students will continue to work on it. We supply, I mean, we provide them with uh, pocket money to do so. And we also give them more funding to do so and they continue working on it for the next uh, half a year to what, one year or something like that. And we tap on our wider network of community partners to do trials, eventually leading to um, 
uh, deployment into community. These are just some of the examples. Um, I, I, it's hard for me to, some of them are actually embedded videos, but I can't really click to make the video work. But anyway, um, yeah, so we work with IC2 Prep House to develop at Flexi, which interestingly is being actually sold to other organizations. We actually sell that for about $74, $84. Uh, we sell them to CPAS as well. Uh, we work with PCS. Uh, they run inclusive kindergarten with uh, uh, children with autism, I, I think. And, and we developed this Learn More software together with the teachers. We recorded their voice into the animation and then that helps the students to stay focused in the learning. Um, we also did like iPush for CPAS students to help those um, who need help to um, manually push their wheelchair. Um, Makan Together is a project that we did for a visually impaired gentleman uh, from St. Louis Elder Care. Uh, it's an adaptive tableware. It's supposed to help people who, can't see, who have low vision to uh, you know, feed themselves properly. Uh, yeah, and, and a few other things uh, you can see. Uh, Stay in Touch is an AAC system that we worked with AWA for this, uh, this young girl over there uh, who has uh, uh, yeah, language, uh, speech uh, issues. So, yeah, so over time, we build up a community of uh, network, uh, sorry, a ne network of community partners, uh, as you can see over this screen. Uh, so this is where they are very helpful um, resources and our allies to help uh, us test our prototypes that we develop with one of the service providers. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so basically, yeah, that, that is the end of the slides. I only have six minutes, so I guess I used up my six minutes. <laughs> Thanks. Very interesting. Yeah. So we'll, we'll go to Rachel. We'll come back to James with questions later. We'll go I may go this. slightly above six minutes, hopefully not by too much. Hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Chen Siu Yung. I am a 30-something-year-old Chinese woman in a black outfit and a multicolored jacket. Um, so to really understand my scholarship, I think it's important to understand the different hats that I wear because true innovation happens when we embrace and integrate all the passions that we have in our lives. Apart from being a faculty member at NTU, I'm also a family member. I have a younger brother who is non-speaking and autistic. So it really was my family circumstances that led me to embark on this academic path. When I'm not busy being a faculty member, I uh, wear a more artistic hat. <laughs> I love music. Uh, I do improvisational violin in my free time. And I also love tinkering and prototyping and building things. So I'm very fortunate to have been able to integrate these interests in my everyday uh, scholarship. At NTU, I teach in linguistics. Uh, I do have a formal training in linguistics, psychology, and I did my PhD in special education. So my academic training is quite multidisciplinary. At NTU, I teach classes like neurodiversity and communicative disabilities. So I bring uh, people from the disabled community in and we have guest speakers. We look at autobiographies um, by uh, individuals who are disabled and the class has dialogues with the community. I also teach a second class called Designing Interactive Environments for Learning, where I bring humanities students into the School of Engineering to do some prototyping. <laughs> Not easy, but I'm doing my best. <laughs> um, so my scholarship in general is motivated by the conviction that communication is a basic human right, and it's a right that is not afforded to everyone. If you really think about it, it's pervasive in daily functioning. Uh, it's, it's relevant to how we exercise agency in healthcare. And more foundationally, it's about how we connect with other human beings. In our society, communication is on a hierarchy with speech at the very top and everything else at the wayside. I mean, this is how I'm uh, communicating with all of you uh, today. But as I'm talking to all of you now, I'm also gesturing, I'm using my hands. I'm looking at you and I see you looking back at me and smiling and nodding. <laughs> so really, communication is bi-directional and the body plays a very foundational role in communication. Now, I've studied various disabled populations. Uh, I've, I've studied uh, people who are blind. I've studied people with dyspraxia, but I've focused mostly on non-speaking autistic individuals of all ages in my work. To uh, pursue my scholarship, 
I seek to understand first and intervene second. So what I do is I take video cameras into the everyday homes, schools, therapy sessions of my participants, and I film their naturally occurring interactions. And with methodologies from linguistics, I look at the communication patterns on a micro scale. So I look at how their body shifts in eye gaze, vocalizations, all play a part in communication. Autism uh, is very often thought as a condition of social deficit, uh, being in their own world. But what I've been finding in my data is that communication can happen but through the body. And sometimes these uh, communicative actions go amiss because of the prevalent focus on speech. Now, um, speech is something that I've been find, finding to be prioritized in uh, the everyday interactions of my participants. But what I've also been finding is that very often the assistive communicative devices that we design for this population are also centered around speech. Uh, as an example, we have a lot of speech generative devices. Uh, they are an array of symbols that the AAC user has to um, select and it will provide voice output. Uh, these are very, very complex to use and especially for my participants who have poor fine motor skills, uh, it's very difficult, the onus is on them to really accommodate to the speaking world. And so in my interventions, what I seek to do is I seek to flip the narrative. Instead of having them accommodate to us, how can we accommodate to them? How can we return to the foundations of communication and in a mode that is comfortable and naturally occurring for our disabled, uh, for my disabled participants? So in this slide, you'll see one of my interventions. Uh, at the top of the slide, you'll see I've titled it Communication Beyond Speech. On the right-hand side, there is a picture of myself and my collaborator, Ariana Ning. And we are sitting on the floor with our feet on various colored mats, and we are touching hands. This is called the Magical Musical Mat. It's an interactive environment that maps interpersonal touch to music. So when two people sit or stand on the mats and touch hands, Music plays and changes dynamically according to different touch-based interactions. On the left, I'm going to show a video of one of my autistic participants interacting on the mat. So can we have that plate? Thank you. <laughs> this is Chloe and her mother. Chloe is five and she's autistic and non-speaking. She's sitting on one mat with her mom sitting behind her. So her mom is reaching forward and touching her thighs. And each time she touches her thighs, a note from Ode to Joy, which is Chloe's favorite song, plays. Mom touches her thighs in alternation. Now Chloe tries her best to touch her own thigh, but nothing happens. She reaches behind, takes her mom's hands, and hand on top of the other, they are now playing Ode to Joy, Chloe's favorite songs, song on her thighs. So I've run this project with an autism clinic and with several families with non-speaking autistic children. The interactions here have been very, very rich. The children uh, kiss and hug their parents and I've seen a lot of dancing. <laughs> and um, yeah, okay, that's the end of the video. <laughs> you can see Chloe smiling over here. So, um, and what's really interesting too is that on a fine-tuned level, these interactions are actually deeply complex. So children and their parents even invent their own games initiated by the children. So to kind of uh, round up my uh, sharing, uh, I think accessibility and inclusion you know, have really gained traction uh, in our field. And in my work, accessibility and inclusion can truly happen uh, through the practice of empathy. It's about uh, sometimes stepping beyond our own um, experience and into somebody else's. So that's what I hope to achieve in my work. And with that, uh, thank you so much. I'll pass the mic on. Thank you, Rachel. That was very inspiring. So we'll move on to Mengi for his sharing. We'll, we'll certainly come back to you, to panelists. There's so many questions in my mind. I'm sure there are a lot of questions from the audience as well. Mengi, over to you. Thank you so much, Soranga. Um, wonderful to hear the... Um, well, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to come and sh share, and it's wonderful to be here this, uh, this uh, today. Uh, really excited to hear uh, the sharing from uh, James and the work he does, and Rachel. 
uh, the, way, and the work you do, and just want to say thank you so much for spontaneously giving that video description. It's so, 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 so helpful for me. Um, I teach at the National Institute of Education, NIE, at, uh, at NTU. And essentially, we are a teacher training institution. Uh, so we, pre we prepare teachers uh, to be uh, trainee teachers to, uh, to teach in the local system in Singapore. Uh, in my particular work, um, we prepare the special education teachers, and we also prepare a group called the special educational needs officers, and these are individuals who work um, alongside their teachers in the mainstream. Um, the research that I do um, spanned uh, inclusive special education, uh, uh, broadly uh, uh, research, I, I study into inclusion um, uh, efforts, how inclusion takes place within the school, uh, school culture. Uh, assistive technology is also uh, an area of my interest, being myself um, an AT user, being visually impaired. So it's, um, I think being here uh, today has been um, a wonderful opportunity for me to, uh, to hear the exciting um, initiatives that's been taking place, the level of energy that all the participants have shared, um, and the different uh, collaborative efforts uh, available in the, um, in the, in the community. Um, I think one thing that I, I, I want to just take on from, uh, uh, from today's sharing is that there's lots of uh, programs in place, lots of uh, projects in place, um, and, um, and that means that this culminates in different uh, either uh, products, devices, AT devices, different services, different programs. Um, so a huge part of my work um, in, uh, in NIE, because we, we teach teachers, right? We are preparing them in teacher education. Um, one of that, one p big part of that work is how do we get teachers to be better equipped in thinking about assistive technology? <clears throat> so um, I think it's not uncommon for teachers, for example, to be in a situation where they are supporting a student and they may not understand how best to support the student um, or not aware that there may be certain assistive technology devices. Um, so what we try and work with the teachers and, and give them uh, a sense of um, uh, understanding, how, do, how does someone think about equipping um, evaluating, considering the different uh, options available for them. So again, right, if you pause to think for a moment, there are so many types of different disabilities out there. And at the same time, there are so many different types of technologies to cater to the many types of disabilities. Now, if you're a teacher in, in the system and you, and you are going to come across some of these uh, 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 different types of students and uh, to think about what sort of technologies might be best catered for them. Uh, how do we go about doing that in a way that is simple but yet effective? Um, some earlier research that I've done suggests or points to this kind of a, a scenario. So, Teacher A will go to teacher B, and teacher A will ask teacher B, I have this student in my class, and he or she has this particular disability. And I see that in your class, you have a similar profile of a student. What has worked for you? Teacher B says, actually, I use this device. Why don't you try it too? And I think that's fine, right? Most of the time, that would work to help support um, a student, but I think the process of matching the technology to the student's needs has to go beyond just what someone else says it works for them. 
Uh, nothing wrong to have that as a start point, but I think it, it can't just stop at that first step. So I think part of the process that what we want to try and help teachers understand, uh, maybe there are a little bit more areas, you know, you have to kind of probe a bit further. You might want to observe how, how the student does things. We might want to understand what sort of environment the student is working in. Do they just stay in the classroom? Do they move from classroom to classroom? Do they, do they need that assistive technology at home? Do they carry it down to school? Do they move from the school to the canteen, school to the auditorium, school to the um, sports hall, school to the library, uh, school to the classroom, to the lab, and so forth? So I think once we start thinking about that, then we realize um, maybe there's a bit more that we need to consider when, when thinking about um, the assistive technology match to the student. So I, I think one other point I'll just quickly make. Um, part of that process is also, and I think this was raised earlier, I think Ron raised it in, in one of his uh, points that cost is a factor indeed, but I think, I think Ron was uh, earlier on in the panel was talking about simplicity. So there's this huge context also that we want to try and raise to the student. Do we always look for the most complex uh, sorry, do we, always look for, do we always want to look for the most sophisticated technology to deal with the, uh, to the need? So there's this uh, 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 complexity of issue versus sophistication of uh, the technology kind of uh, uh, tension uh, we also want to suggest to the, stu to the uh, students or to the people making those... Um, um, helping make those consideration issues. Okay, I think I'll stop there and uh, we'll can continue the, uh, the conversation afterwards. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mingyi. I'm sure there will be a lot of questions in your mind. Let's hold on those first. Uh, we have another panelist who couldn't be here today in person, but he has shared his message through a video. So we'll play that video while you organize your thoughts and getting ready with your questions. Then we'll start the interactive discussion. So can we play the video from Victor? Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Kwan Song Victor Zhuang. I am a visiting fellow at the University of Sydney and also a faculty member of the Wigan Lee School of Communications and Information at Nanyang Technological University. I'm also a former Shivanik scholar and a Princeton Fung Global Fellow and while I am an academic, a disability studies scholar, at times I feel like I'm a traveling salesman in the business of selling ideas. And I hope that you'll recognize this towards the end of this video. Today I'm wearing a, a blue Mandarin colored uh, short sleeve sh shirt, um, wearing gold rim spectacles. I have, I think, short hair, which is, I think, becoming a bit too long. Uh, and my background is this uh, white, sort of ward background, which is actually blinds. I want to start by um, thanking the team for inviting me, particularly Greg Min and Elvin. Uh, it's really exciting to be able to come back to SG Enable and to learn of the MOU signing uh, with the Civil Project. Having been with SG Enable at the start when it was founded in 2013, before I left in 2017, this event and also others it's really testament to the amazing work that SG Enable has done, is doing, and will continue to do. So kudos to the management and leadership at SG Enable, and also all its staff and everyone for believing in the cause of inclusion. I can't be here today because I'm, I'm based in Sydney, uh, but I'm really excited to be able to offer some thoughts on academia's role in promoting innovation with disability, and also very excited to be sharing with Saranga James, Rachel, and Mingyi. Mingyi is actually a longtime friend uh, and also collaborator. I would even say partner in crime. Uh, so if there's questions specific for me, I'm sure Mingyi will be more than happy to help me take them at the end of this video. I want to start by saying simply that te te technology has played a key role in disabled people's life. And there have been many important technological innovations for disability. 
the wheelchair is one of them. You see this picture of the wheelchair, the white cane, hearing aids, as well as prosthesis and you new know, and key and technologies that we may have taken for granted today, like the keyboard and personal computers. In case you find this uh, pictures familiar, they're actually taken from the enabling guide. So thank you, SG Neighbor, for providing this uh, pictures. And also more recently, you know, technological innovations have been crucial. At the Consumer Electronics Show this year in Vegas, which I went, um, there were some of them, right? Uh, one of them is the Aerostrap, which is like a sauna uh, that uses haptic to warn blind people of obstacles. Badger, uh, which is a, a closed caption uh, smart badge. So you see, you know, technological innovations for disability, right? Uh, assisting in the past and also today. My provocation for us is that instead of technological innovation, we must instead spotlight disability innovation. But what is it? What is disability innovation? Let me explain by highlighting and introducing a recent book of ours, Not Without Us. Earlier this year, my partner in crime, Ming Yi, together with Dan Goodley and myself, we officially launched Singapore's first disability studies volume, which is titled Not Without Us, Perspectives on Disability and Inclusion in Singapore. And you, you'll see a cover of the book right here. In this volume, we center disability as generative knowledge and positive embodiment. And by that, we mean that disability can offer new insights in thinking about society. As an example, Skilling, who many of you will know is Gyobun's PA, has a chapter in this volume where she talks about assistive technology in her life in a fun and engaging way. So yes, this chapter that she writes is about technology, but in it, her lived experience of disability provides important insights into how inc inclusion happens in Singapore, as do many of the other chapters in this volume. So, what is disability innovation in technology? In a 2008 paper, my friend, colleague, and mentor, Jared Goggin, wrote that while technological innovation has key roles to play in, enabl in enabling disabled people, some, if not many, of these technologies are framed and guided by a distinct reliance on notions of ability. As Gordon writes in that paper, unfortunately, such technologies have the effect of reproducing an ableist framework, enforcing normalcy rather than building in, creating and contributing to new modes of living which embrace difference and, di and diversity. So riffing off this critique, of technological innovation. I would say simply that disability innovation highlights disability's central role in informing technology and in reframing norms in society. So what are some examples? Well, this is one. If you notice, I have auto captions embedded within Microsoft PowerPoint using automated speech recognition to generate captions and now very much present in a lot of the systems that we use. So Zoom, Teams, and like, as you can see, even PowerPoint. Another example is the iPhone and also Mac systems where accessibility is incorporated as part of design. I remember how in the past when the iPhones used to have real buttons and how I would always enable the iPhone assistive touch button to use because my physical buttons no longer work. Another example, which many of you might be familiar with, is Microsoft's Seeing AI, which is designed and informed by disabled people and which uses artificial intelligence and computer vision to identify items. What really draws these technologies together is that they are not just disability dongles, invented for the sake of being invented, but rather disability innovations, where disability is centered as design principle and which has the potential to challenge the ways in which society is organized and designed. 
And it's also in this deployments of such technology, specifically emerging technology, that Gerard, Gorgian, and I are, are exploring together in a book we are co-writing. So look up for that book when it's out. So as a final rejoinder, and some say I might be a little bit naggy at this stage, I will reiterate the takeaway I hope you will remember from this video. That we should not think of technological innovations for disability, but rather we need to pursue disability innovations for technology. Thank you. Thanks. I'm glad that Mengi is there to, to take up questions for Victor as well. <laughs> so on a serious note, I'm sure you will have questions. Uh, uh, we can take those questions from you. I'll, I'll kickstart the discussion. I had some other questions in mind as we discussed before, but listening to you, it just made me you know, reconsider my questions and ask this sort of overarching question that cuts across uh, what you shared, all four of you. So there is this tension between creating something truly innovative, something that's sort of out of this world, but at the same time, making it useful and, and how do you think of the practical aspect, right? So there's a, uh, on one side, you want to support Blue Sky Innovation. On the other side, you want to make sure that there is a impact and, and you want to be empathizing and make sure that you know, there is a, a, a powerful use case at the end. Uh, so one of the questions I have is, you know, when you do your work or when you get your students uh, to, to innovate or when you teach some of the uh, classes focus on building assistive tech, how do you think of striking this balance and, and how do you tackle this challenge on your own work? Any one of you, uh, you can, uh, you know. So, I mean, should, just to elaborate a little bit more, if somebody said uh, about a, a device uh, that you can just talk and it gives you all the answers, you know, even five years ago, people would be like, this is science, science fiction, right? Now we have all these AI tools, GPTs, that can do that. And so, so I guess, in some sense, you have to believe in those futuristic, but keep on anchoring yourself to, to the ground. And, and I can give you an example of work that we are doing, which Mengi is also helping uh, on the side, which is taking an assistive tech we had before, which was a wearable device that helped blind people access information on the go, taking it to a next level. What if you had a flying eye that can fly around and tell you what is there ahead of time? Uh, that may sound futuristic. It's a drone that carries around and, and you come out from the MRT. I want exit C. And the drone goes and find exit C, come to you and guide you, right? It's a far future, but you have to start from somewhere. But of course, then you have to, uh, you have to deal with the question. So can this be a reality? What other infrastructural changes, policy changes? And there's a lot of, lot of challenges to tackle with, right? So how do you think about that? I'm very curious on a personal level as well. Maybe I'll just start the ball rolling. I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> I, I think uh, AT has really evolved quite significantly. And uh, I, I mean, we are certainly, I think as a disabled person, um, I'm using AT all the time. I, I mean, without Without voiceover on my phone, I wouldn't be able to communicate with other people to be able to use technology in a way um, that is that helps me to be to plugged in to be plugged in into society, right? To be to carry out my work at the university, I use screen readers uh, to teach. Uh, I'm able to grade my students' assignments because uh, they submit it in a way, right, in electronically and I can listen to their scripts uh, with my technology. So I, I think all these things, uh, and I think uh, the te technology, no matter, you know, the, no matter what uh, disability someone has, it comes in different forms to compensate for the disability that they have in order for them to be able to uh, function in, 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 in society. 
I think what, uh, if I can just make a, a grand, um, if I'm understanding Victor's, um, Victor and Gerard, I, 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 I know Gerard Gorgon too. Um, he's a, now he's a professor at the University of Sydney. Um, if I understand their hypothesis and proposition about the being disability innovative rather than assistive technology, um, uh, purely just focusing on, on the AT, I, 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 I think they are, and, and, and Victor did say provocation, so I'll take, I'll take the word provocation very uh, explicitly here. Uh, to suggest that um, it's not just we don't use just use and take you know we don't just deploy assistive technology we don't just design and and take on assistive technology just at at its face value right um, certainly there's a, a face value that whatever AT is being designed it it helps right it helps the, the disabled person to to function better right to compensate where the disability is, and the AT helps to bridge um, that so-called, and, and I'm probably using a very um, uh, pejorative term here um, by saying uh, to, to, de to, 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 over to, to compensate for that deficit. Of course, in today's context, if we talk about disability, and there's a strong and stronger, and I think uh, uh, part of the disability studies agenda is uh, is also to initiate and to advocate for a lot more scholarship and a lot more um, perspectives from disabled persons. And I think one of that might be to say that yes, AT is helpful, but if we take a very prov provocative, critical uh, approach to that. Um, Maybe the warning or the caution is that disabled persons want to be part of society, but also want to be part of society enabled to define who they are, right? Not necessarily to be subsumed again and to be so-called pressured into be going, being quote-unquote normal, if I can take that provocation. Uh, so in other words, how do we help disabled persons become more, um, to be a consummate disabled person, if I can, if I can challenge that, or use that as a way to suggest my disability is something that um, uh, I'm proud of, right? It, it's not something to, to hide away from. Uh, and in other words, to be able to embrace that and to be, we hear a lot about generative AI today, right? But what about, what's the disability experience and how can it be a generative process of creation that leads the disabled person to create a space, an identity, a definition, that is uniquely um, disabled in orientation. Um, again, I hope I'm not <laughs> over um, over in, uh, interpreting the provocation. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mingi. Any of you want to share additional thoughts, Rachel? Okay. Oh, James. <laughs> yeah. Okay, James. So, so maybe I'll I'll give my take as a very practical engineer, right? So there's always this, um, you know, as, as engineers developing, there's always this uh, innate uh, push to make things very technologically advanced, very uh, complex. So there's always, you know, on one end of the spectrum, complexity. And yet on the other end of the spectrum, we also want to make sure that the technology is practical, is feasible, is accessible, right? So where and how do we strike the balance, right? So I think this is, this is, this is important. And this is how I see uh, Schrenger's question, right? Where, you know, how do we move the slider such that it is not too overly tech, uh, but yet 
uh, it is practical, accessible, um, and, and also at the same time, uh, perhaps bespoke, right, for if you're talking about uh, disability innovations. Um, I was reminded about this uh, story that, uh, you know, that I, I encountered during one of my visits to SIPA school, um, where I brought a group of students to try to, um, you know, look at some of the challenges that their students, uh, the, the children with cerebral palsy faces when they were trying to feed themselves, right? So when we, when we went to the school, we saw that the school actually had two sets of, uh, for so, some of you who know, uh, this thing called an OB feeder. So it's like a, a robotic thing that is supposed to scoop out the food and then try to figure out where your mouth is and when you open the mouth, then you're supposed to put the food into your mouth. Right, so uh, the school actually bought two sets, right? And I was told that it, it cost about 9K and it's a uh, very advanced, uh, perhaps with computer vision and, and stuff like that. And when we got there, um, one of the set was actually in the storeroom. And the, because, you know, it was down and there's no one in Singapore who is able to fix it because the technician is, uh, they're all based in US. And they say that, well, if you want to fix it, you have to send the whole system back to US and then the shipment plus everything is going to cost about the same as buying a new one. And then the other set, they were still using it, but they were, um, I think it, it, there was a rubber band tied around the spoon because the spoon was kind of broken and they just kind of fixed it. Now, um, so we, I got the students to think about this whole feeding behavior and how we can actually try to develop something that could actually still work. And, and so when, so the students actually uh, went on to develop this, what we call e-feeder, it's in one of my slides earlier, uh, and it costs like maybe $220. It, yeah, so it's a fraction of the 9K. Uh, it's not so complex, it doesn't have co complex computer vision. Uh, and actually, we, the teacher did ask the girl, right, um, whether you, you like to use this e-feeder, and she said yes. And so the teacher went on to ask her, why, why do you like to use this, right, you know, this is a very simple device. And the, and the student surprisingly just said, oh, because I like the fact that when I use my hand to tap on the aluminium foil, the arm will scoop out the, the food for me, and then I can launch forward and, you know, eat it myself. And yeah, and I don't have the spoon that will, you know, incorrectly aim to the wrong part of my face. Uh, so uh, there is enablement, right? She felt enabled, right? Uh, because of uh, a lower technology, a lower form of technology or a more co cost accessible form of technology. So, so, so therefore, that led me to think like that, well, sometimes, uh, you know, when we talk about disability innovations, it's really more about whether it it meets the person's need rather than, uh, you know, how complex or how technologically advanced it is. And which, by the way, you know, if you talk about uh, maybe Surangas, just know the example about the drone to, to search out for uh, uh, which exit in the MRT station, come on, at, at the end of the day, how many people is willing to pay for that? Who is able to afford that, right? So we really talk, need to talk about technology, uh, developing technology that is uh, cost accessible. Thanks, Vishal. Thank you. So, I mean, my co-panelists have done some amazing sharing. I'll echo some of the points, but, you know, within the context of my own work. Um, so I think we live in a day and age where we are tickled by technological advancement. And, um, you know, this discussion brings me back to my um, undergraduate days when I was uh, uh, very young and naive. <laughs> I felt a, a strong passion for the autistic community even back then, and I attempted to make a keyboard to teach autistic children how to type. I had read some academic articles on the success of uh, keyboard typing, and I really wish the same for the community here in Singapore. Now, when I brought my uh, janky prototype to angel investors with my little slide deck, I received the same comment from everyone, like, this is not technological advancement. This goes backwards in time. We want something to do with VR. We want something that pushes technology forward. <laughs> and so I didn't get any funding. I mean, back then I also lacked the skills to create a good enough prototype, so I totally get it. But um, this is precisely what I mean by being tickled by a technological advancement. 
Sometimes uh, looking at the needs and preferences of people who we work with really brings us back to older technologies. So uh, in my own work, uh, autistic individuals I work with, uh, they do a lot better with more tangible artifacts. Uh, they have very diverse sensory preferences. Uh, they love rubbing their hands over keyboards, feeling the texture of mats. And this is something that I work into my own designs, uh, which is why I, in a lot of my designs, I do tangible computing. I stay away from screen-based designs. So in my, in my classes and when I work with students, what I do is I encourage them to not be tickled by this uh, advancement in technology. <laughs> but to take a step back and to really work with uh, the people that they're designing things for. And sometimes that can bear greater fruits. So yeah, thank you. Thanks, Rachel. If we can have a few more minutes, I'll maybe get... If anyone from the audience has a question, we can, we can open the floor. Any questions from the... Yeah, there's one over there. Uh, okay. Hi, thanks very much, panel. Um, very interesting day today. You're preaching to the converted. My question to you is, how do we get this out there into the general population? I feel like I'm banging my head against a brick wall. So maybe I, I'll, I'll start the, the response. Because it, it's, a, it's a really valid question, right? At the end of the day, it has to go out to the people, right? And, and how, when, and, and, and what are the strategies? I think that's where the partnerships and, and, and that's where the academia could not do it on, on its own, right? That's where you need partnerships. You need to, from the get-go, while you are innovating, look at the, the, the other pieces of the puzzle, which includes where's the funding, where's the outreach, who can do the... the the, the training education, uh, uh, the support structure. So you need a lot of partnerships and, and that's why I think it's, at least in my mind, it's fairly important while we innovate new technologies, thinking of a user need and finding the right solution, engage those other parties, engage in the discussion right from the, the, the get-go so that you start thinking about them at the early stage rather than trying to rectify them and, and find a way out. So that's at least my suggestion. If we do that more, then some of these things, very cool stuff happens in the university, will not rest in the, in the shelves, it will go out. So we have a, as part of at least, uh, you know, a, academic point of view, we also have a part to play where we have to sort of put them out early enough, engage in the conversations and and build partnerships and, and support to take them out. And if we do that, then maybe we'll find answers to your question and we'll, you'll see more, of, more of things uh, you know, going into the hands of people. Anyone else want to uh, reflect? Sure, I'll give it a go. Thank you. That's a fantastic question. Um, I think I'll address it in two different ways. The first one is within my role as an academic I think being an assistant professor in a public university really does put me in a good position to teach about the disabled experience to the next, next generation of working adults. For example, many students who come through the linguistics program want to be allied health professionals in the future. They want to be special educators or enter into a speech therapy program after graduation. And so this is where classes like my neurodiversity class come in handy. Um, I, you know, have the students read autobiographies, dialogue with community members. And so I see my role as a professor, as educating the next generation. The second thing that I wanted to bring up is um, I'm quite influenced by the paradigm of universal design, that to design for persons with disability is to design for uh, much more. A very common example is the ramp. 
the ramp uh, is very helpful for people with wheelchairs, but also parents with strollers. And if you're uh, jogging and really tired uh, climbing up the stairs, you can take the ramp as well. <laughs> but beyond universal design too, I think um, designing for persons with disabilities helps everyone else get to know a completely different experience from what we are used to. For example, designing for the non-speaking autistic community allows us to become more aware of our senses and how our senses can play a part in communication. So yeah, thank you very much for your question. We have actually gone past our allocated time. If, uh, so okay, we'll, we'll conclude, yeah. So the, the topic is super interesting even, uh, you know, uh, I think we have a lot more uh, that I wish we could share, and, and uh, I have more questions to ask. But the time is limited, uh, but you will find the panelists uh, after this panel session out there during the, the networking session. So do bring your questions to them, and, and thank you so much for spending time and, and sharing these thoughts. And I think collectively, as this community from academia, as you, as you heard, there's a, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, personal inspiration, there's a lot of effort, there's a lot of aspiration to do what we can do to sort of bring innovation in a meaningful way and, and help, you know, I think in a broader sense, I believe every one of us are disabled, whether it's permanent or situational. So it's really about helping each other, right? Helping each other, leveraging technology when possible and, and doing our part in the university context. So. Uh, on behalf of everyone, I thank the panel for sharing your thoughts and, and I wish you continue to do the great work that you have been doing that will benefit the community. Thank you so much.